Praise God. Amen. Well, I'm glad you're here this morning. You're looking good. Well, that's a poor response right there. You don't believe it? Well, it's okay. It's my opinion. I think you're looking pretty good. I want to share a message with you very quickly this morning about winning the battle for your mind. Winning the battle for your mind. How many of you know that we think things sometimes that we should not think? I'm just wondering right now, what are you thinking? Amen? Uh, some of you are sitting here this morning, I'm going to tell you what you're thinking. That donut is gone and you're thinking about lunch. That's what you're thinking right now. Others of you are thinking, it's two minutes till 12 and he's just starting to preach. Jesus, even so, come quickly. <laughs> Others of you are sitting around thinking, I don't know anybody in this building. Some of you are sitting here thinking, I know everybody in this building. We're having all kinds of thoughts. How many of you know thoughts rule our lives? Let me give you an example. Several years ago, I had the opportunity, it was back in 2000, to take a missions team to Germany. A lot of fun, a lot of, a lot of challenge. And uh, uh, we got to go uh, to Eastern Germany, former communist Germany, to a city called Hoyersberda. Say that real quick three times. Amen. Hoyersberda is where we went. It was right on the border with Poland. And uh, it was a very interesting place. Uh, stark, uh, old buildings, uh, dirty streets. It was just an interesting place. And when I got there, uh, we went to the church and uh, we found not this immaculate facility or even a facility that was in really good shape. It was in really bad shape. Uh, the church had been given a building that, that probably, well, I know, it had been condemned at one time. Because when the pastor took me into the back part of the church, it literally, and these were all concrete structures, literally had been busted to pieces. Looked like it had been bombed. And he said, that's what the sanctuary used to look like until we picked up all of the rubble that was in there. It was just, it was a, it was a very different kind of place. Uh, the people were different. Uh, uh, they, they were cold. And when I say cold, I'm not talking about burr. I'm talking about some of you are burr. I'm talking about they were cold emotionally, cold spiritually. Uh, they, they weren't real friendly. They didn't take to real friendly people. So here we had a whole busload of friendly people from Appalachia, Virginia, in Hoyesberga, Germany, trying to make an impact for Christ. And, and when we got there, everything that could go wrong worked against us. I remember the first morning we went to breakfast and the missionary and his wife were kind enough to, to fix breakfast for us. But when they brought breakfast down, there was this thing called, um, um, I, I, I don't know exactly how to put it, it was a dumpling. How many of you have ever had dumplings? Okay. Well, this dumpling had a skeletal system. Okay. Uh, this lady had actually formed the dumplings around croutons. It had a skeletal system. Uh, I, I ate mine. I think there were three on my plate. I ate them six times. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Down, back up, and down again. Amen. It was. I was struggling. The next, the next meal we went, and they, they, they brought us eggs. How many of you like eggs? Eggs are good, but how many of you know eggs should be cooked? Absolutely. And eggs should not be put on top of the refrigerator. They should be kept in the refrigerator. They kept the milk and the eggs on top of the refrigerator. Never did figure that one out. But when they brought me my egg and I'm looking and I'm thinking, hallelujah, I know what this is. It doesn't have a skeletal system. I hope. Amen. It's an egg. It's a hard boiled egg. And I begin to tap into it and it began to run all over my plate. It was a glorious soft boiled egg. Uh, the food was a challenge. Uh, the sleeping quarters were a challenge. And when we started doing ministry, we went out on the street and we started witnessing to people and they would literally openly reject us. I had one guy chase me, swatting at me, screaming nine, nine, nine. And I figured out he wasn't saying seven, eight, nine. He was screaming no, 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 no. 
as I was trying to present the gospel to him. My wife, uh, she began to talk to a lady, uh, and this lady had read the Quran, she had read the Bible, she had read Hindu scriptures, she had read Buddhist scriptures, and there was no convincing her that, the, the, that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. The only one that was successful was my daughter. She was eight years old at the time. She was my evangelist. She just they, they, they just had enough respect for an eight-year-old that they let her finish her sentences. It was, it was a challenge. We sat up on the street, and we put these uh, uh, the, uh, a music system out there, and we started doing mime and drama. Everywhere I've ever gone, on street corners, around the world, and done drama and mime with American music, everybody stops, you get a crowd, and even if they can't understand what you're saying, they watch and they listen, and it's amazing how the power of the Holy Spirit melts hearts, crosses the language barriers, it's amazing, but not in Hoya Spirit. As we stood there on the street corner with our portable, battery-powered PA system and American music and, and, and doing the mimes and the drama, they literally walked past us and never looked at us as if we were not there. I remember the first night that we had a debriefing with our team. We, my wife and I went down to the local convenience store and bought everything that looked like a potato chip and a cheese it that they had. Brought them back to the room and said, these don't have skeletal systems and they're, 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 they're good. And we had a little party. Our, our team's morale was going straight down like this. Because they were thinking, this is hard, this is difficult, I don't like the food, I, I don't want to be here, I want to go back home. Questions started to arise. When do we go back home, Pastor Mike? When, when is the flight out of Germany? When are we going back home? And, and we began to get a mindset that was not conducive. To doing ministry. So every night we had to kind of we had to kind of share with them the truth to combat the thoughts that were coming through their head. God honored us and blessed us. And even though we didn't see hundreds of people saved, one night we had a spaghetti dinner. We invited all the students and all the young adults we could find on the streets to come. And we had a spaghetti dinner. And that night, when spaghetti was done, we led two young Germans who spoke English into a living faith relationship with Jesus Christ. They both prayed the sinner's prayer, invited Christ into life, tears and all. It was an amazing night. I was so pumped. In spite of raw eggs, in spite of dumplings with skeletal systems, in spite of crowds on the street who would not give us the time of day, we had pushed through and God had given us favor and we had seen two except Jesus Christ the Savior Lord I could not wait to go tell the missionary and so I I saw him later and I said whenever you've got a chance I just want to sit down and talk with you and he said well let's let's sit down and talk after dinner so after dinner we went in we sat down and I said I said listen I just want to tell you I am so excited I know you've got a hard job here we're getting a taste of that literally I did not mention the food but we're getting a taste of that and I said, I understand your job is difficult, but I said, I just want to share with you that God is good. And we led two young men to Jesus this afternoon, and it was a glorious moment. And so I just want to report to you, we've got a few days left. We're going to do everything in our power to win some more people to Jesus. He looked at me, and he said, you don't know what you're talking about. He said, those two young men are not saved. I said, what? What do you mean they're not saved? He said, they're not saved. He said, I've been here for 27 years and they don't get saved we don't have salvation to you. those two young men are not saved and I'm thinking at this point what happens if you hit a missionary what happens <laughs> if you sucker punch a missionary what happens you know you lose your credentials do they lock you up and what happens I said sir all due respect I was there I was there. They speak English. We prayed with them. The sinner's prayer. There was more than one of us. We helped them. We led them to the Lord. They repented of their sins. They accepted Jesus Christ. They acknowledged He's the Son of God. They believe He died for their sins and rose again on the third day. Sir, all respect intended. Those two young men, if they died today, would get to be with Jesus because they're saved. He said, enough. Discussion over. Not talking about it anymore. They're not saved. And that's the end of the discussion. At this point, I'm thinking, what happens if you kill a missionary? Amen. I, forget hit me. I walked out of there stretching my hand. I said, dear Jesus, what in the world? 
What's that all about? What kind of conversation did I just have with this guy? What is he thinking? What? And there you go. That was the point that the Holy Spirit helped me see. This man had been there so long and had, had been through so much and had seen such poor results that he thought he was convinced in his head that no one in Germany, particularly Eastern Germany, in a village called Hoyesberg could ever be saved. But I'm here this morning to tell you he was wrong because of his thoughts. About six years later, a friend of mine went over and visited the same church. And when he came back, I asked him, I said, there were two young men. And, and, and I said, I'm asking, he said, one of them said to tell you hello. He drives the church bus now and picks up people and brings them to church. And I'm going, cha-ching, that man saved. Amen? Now listen to me. Some of you are in this room. And you're sitting here, you, you want to help me kill that mission. You, you want to take a swing at him too because you're just like, he needs to get over that. Somebody needs to knock some sense into that man. Well, listen to me. Most of us in this room today have got some thinking that needs to change. Go with me quickly to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Paul the Apostle wrote these words. Listen to this. This is powerful. This is life changing. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're battling with. I don't know what your thought life looks like. But God wants to do some adjustments in your mind today. Look at your neighbor after you find those verses and tell them, say, I, I think there needs to be some changing in your head. Tell them, I think there needs to be some changing in your head. Amen. There are some husbands and wives having lots of fun with this right now. Amen. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, Paul says, you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. How many of you in this room want to know the will of God for your life? Let me see your hands want to know the will of God. How many of you want to know the plan of God for your life? How many of you want to find it, walk in it, live it out? How many of you want to experience the blessings of God that comes from living in the middle of the will of God? Y'all aren't just waving your hands. Some of you, if you clap any harder, you're going to take off. Amen. You see, I think there's not anyone here who doesn't want to live that way. But Paul identifies a problem that was a problem then, and it's a problem now. It's the same problem. It doesn't make any difference if it's first century, second century, or our century. It's a problem. And the problem is right here. He says, do not conform to the pattern of the world. Now, the word conform literally means to be squeezed into a mold. How many of you have ever, come on ladies, there's some guys here too, how many of you have ever baked a cake? Come on now, how many of you know what I'm talking about? You make the batter, you put the eggs in there, uh, you, you put the milk and all the stuff, and you stir it up, and then you get the cake pan out, and you pour the cake batter in the pan, you take the pan, put it in the oven, and after the, after the whatever amount of time it is, you can tell I make a lot of cakes, at 300 and whatever degrees it is, it comes out, and it comes out in the shape of the pan you put it in. It has assumed the shape of that pan. If you've got a butt pan that's got some decorations on it, then those, those imprints end up on that cake. If it's just a round pan, then you get a round cake. A square pan will give you a square cake. Listen to me. Most of us in this room have been poured into a mold by the world. We are thinking like everybody else thinks, and it is forming us into a person that is not what God intended us to be. See, some of us, our life is upside down because our, our personal lives, our marriages, our ministry, our businesses have been squeezed into a mold that the world formed. A mold puts limitations on you. You see, when you're squeezed into the mold of the world because of your thinking patterns, listen to me, you forfeit living this large, extravagant, abundant life that Jesus talked about. Because you can't live abundantly. You can't live the way that the Lord wants you to live when you are squeezed into a mold that God did not pour you into. Paul says, do not be conformed. Don't be limited by the world. Don't be contained. But, he says, be transformed. 
The word transform comes from the Greek word metamorpho. Look at your neighbor and impress them with some Greek and say, metamorpho. Metamorpho you. Amen.